think we can get started here. Respect everybody's time and make sure that we get the, enough time in here. My name is Brad Asker. I'm field product manager for uh, Cloud Forms. Uh, there's some good announcements this morning. We'll talk a little bit about how that all fits into the plan as well. Everybody hear me okay in the back? Good. Okay. So, who am I? I've been around the uh, IT industry for a long time. This is my picture. Uh, the title of this is Building the Management Gap. Marketing got a hold of it. Cloud Management Platforms Managing Open Stack and Other Cloud Infrastructures. What does that mean? What we're really going to get into is, is what is a cloud management platform? What is OpenStack? Now, I'm assuming everybody here kind of knows a little bit about OpenStack, but not everybody necessarily knows everything that they need to know, or this may be their first brush on it. Red Hat's involvement in OpenStack, or is it, what is a cloud management platform? Uh, Red Hat Cloud Forms, uh, then our special announcement, and then any q and I'll leave plenty of time at the end for our Q&A. So what is a cloud management platform? So Gartner has this uh, slide. Everything that you see here in yellow are, are really the things that, uh, that we look at for a CMP's capability. A CMP's capability for self-service, service catalog, chargeback, cloud management, capacity management, performance management, uh, configuration and change management, lifecycle management, uh, orchestration, and external cloud connection. Uh, these are all the things that are part of the definition of uh, for Gartner for a cloud management platform. So what is OpenStack? Within Gartner's definition, OpenStack is a cloud infrastructure for cloud-enabled workloads. So all the things that you see uh, is modular architecture designed to easily scale out based on the growing number of uh, core set, set of services. And it is probably the reason why you're here at this conference is to really look at all this stuff, all the pieces that are part of this. Is OpenStack a cloud operating system? In and of itself, uh, OpenStack is not a cloud operating system. It relies on x86 hardware resources underneath. It uh, needs an operating environment, hypervisor services, and leverages existing code bases for its functionality. So it is dependent on the underlying Linux. Uh, Red Hat has a solution for that, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. That is uh, a hardened version of Linux that ships out and is uh, supported in your traditional IT environments with all the support and things that you would expect to come from Red Hat. And, it's, and all of these things are, uh, because of our involvement in OpenStack and of course our many years with Linux, uh, really tied uh, closely together and the teams that do this work very closely together for the various things that are needed within these projects. So Red Hat's OpenStack involvement, Red Hat's been around OpenStack for a while now. Uh, you can see the timeline there. Uh, you'll see here, uh, as we're moving, we're number two contributor here, number one contributor here, number one contributor for Havana, just in from, uh, from corporate commits and uh, closing of, of issues. We're the number one again. So we're committed to it. We love OpenStack. OpenStack's a very large uh, portion of our future. It's a very large number of folks that are at this conference that are very passionate about it. They're, on the committees, they work uh, within uh, the code itself every day. They're committing upstream all the time. And part of Red Hat's commitment to that is, is that we're always committing upstream. We don't just keep little bits for ourselves. We commit upstream and then we work what's upstream down into our release version. So this gives you an idea. Red Hat has, has some chops here. We've got people that know how to do this stuff. Uh, we know how to support customer, drive new features. Uh, and depending on what's going on, if there's a bug being reported by our customers, the possibility the person that where the bug is may work within Red Hat and has actually been working on that area or knows where to go looking for that. Uh, we can help influence the strategy and direction of the product, of the product uh, and enable uh, partner collaboration. We've got a lot of partners that are involved in our ecosystem of all the other things that we do, not just within Red Hat Enterprise. Linux, not just with OpenStack, but within everything that we do as projects. So back to the original themes. What is the differences between OpenStack and a cloud management platform? So again, same, same thing, then we'll break these down to various components uh, of that. Red Hat Platforms gives you the ability to do approval workflows, things like compliance, self-service and chargeback, uh, quota enforcement, cloud bursting, resource management, capacity planning, optimization, configuration management, root, root cause analysis. Now, OpenStack has a lot of over overlapping things. There are different projects that have some of these same goals. 
one of the things that you'll find about a cloud management platform is, is we're, we're providing this at a higher level. We're providing this no matter which computing environment you, you're in, whether it's public or private, whether it's virtualization or cloud. And, and that's really where the differentiation starts to come. And that's really why you look at a cloud management platform. Uh, you get executive dashboards, uh, governance, compliance, IT process orchestration over the entire gamut or whatever it is that you're managing. And that's really for us to do. We love OpenStack, but we're pretty sure that most of our uh, IT customers haven't gone 100% OpenStack all the time for everything uh, within their environment. So we feel that there's a long, long way uh, that uh, people will be using any of these other things, including just bare metal within their own environments. Infrastructure as a service, consumers are some of the consumers that, that work, support, delivery services, folks like Dev and QA, governance, or whatever. And they all come through the single pane of glass. The single pane of glass is Red Hat Cloudforms. Cloudforms gives you four basic modules, and uh, those are insight. What's going on in the environment, the kinds of statistics and things that I need to go know that's going on in my environment. Uh, things like uh, computed insight. So it's nice to know uh, how things are running, but you may want to have uh, visibility into deployments to understand what's the what's where are the hot zones where am I running hot where am I running cold in my environment to help me make placement decisions and I might be making those decisions based on um, the kinds of things like uh, one hour average seven day average thirty day average so that you can make decisions based on that kind of in, insight uh, a lot of reporting and analytics capabilities charge back and trending within the product uh, and control security and compliance based alerting alerting, uh, policy-based resource configuration enforcement. So this comes into play. We'll show several examples of control. Control is really where you can start to make a difference. It's great to know all this information about your environment, but wouldn't it be nice, instead of finding out that somebody's doing something they're not supposed to be doing, that you can actually stop them from doing that, or change the behavior, or shut it down, or whatever it is that you want to do, notify or not. Automation is simply the ability to automate IT processes. When it really gets down to it, we're not doing all these things that we do within compute just for the purpose of, hey, it's neat technology. Some of you might be doing it because it's, hey, it's neat technology. But most of us really want to automate IT tasks. That's really what it's down to is, how fast can I get from pushing the button to what I actually want at the end, and did anybody have to touch it in between, unless I want them to touch it, like an approval process or something like that. Uh, so we'll go into automation as well. Integration. This thing doesn't live in a vacuum, right? In a real enterprise, you're really talking to a lot of other systems, CMDDs, IT, IT, ITSM systems, uh, maybe your IPMs, uh, IP address management, uh, all sorts of event consoles and other things that you have in your environment. You want to do that. And then you actually want to do it through an adaptive management platform that really lets you talk to the infrastructure, which would be your traditional vert, and cloud, which would be your cloud and cloud-like environments. Platforms itself is built from the ground up since day one to be a cloud scale application. It's agent free virtual appliance architecture. We deploy the product as a virtual appliance depending on, on which environment we want to deploy it into. We can deploy one or many of these appliances and each one of the appliances can have special roles within the environment so you can delegate the amount of work that you can do and also so that you can really scale the application uh, which gets you, and load balance and fail back. Uh, Web-based administration, no special agents, no special anything else you have to have, no special client that you have to have other than a web browser to interact with it. Enterprise directory support. A lot of products out on the market don't really understand enterprise directory support or follow, following uh, trusts within federated domains or having multiple domains and the fact that you may have very different schemas in those domains. Uh, Multi-tenancy, of course, you're not going to do any of this stuff unless you're able to support a bunch of different groups, possibly different companies within your organization. Uh, we talked about horizontally scale, scaling and falling back. That is important. There's a lot of products out there that uh, are going to have some serious problems when they start managing very large numbers of workloads uh, in very large environments. We're in some very, very large financial customers, uh, most of which won't allow us to talk about who they are or what they do with this stuff. They're actually financial customers that actually run large infrastructures for other customers. And they're literally managing hundreds and hundreds of thousands of instances or VMs and thousands of servers. Uh, within that environment. Uh, well, uh, management across multiple locations. So uh, if you're an interna international corporation or this corporation's got two data centers, you've got two locations, you want to be able to do that management. And you want to be able to do the management as close as you can to what it is that you're managing 
Uh, so if you end up with uh, things like uh, data cuts and problems uh, from data center, data center to data center, the product itself can still manage that data center even when it's disconnected from the rest of the world. Because you can't really drive some things like policy if it's no longer running. And then management across virtual platforms and public clouds, single pane of glass for all the different kinds of compute that you have. Uh, so we start at the very top, roles-based access control. Very core to the product, everything that's done is filtered through our back. It determines who's allowed to see what, what they're allowed to do within the product. And to the point where you can configure yourself, yourself in some really strange situations where all of a sudden I can't see anything because I changed all the RBAC and now I can't see any of the things that I wanted to look at myself. Uh, cloud intelligence, the analytics and classifications, the relationships there, uh, what kind of information is going on. You want to be able to know that kind of information about the hosts, the VMs, or infrastructure is running on, what's going on at the cluster level, what's going on at an even higher level. Uh, Automation engine for those policies and orchestration, workflows, and approvals. Uh, the control surface for discovery, monitoring, tracking. Here's a good one, discovery. A lot of products out there that uh, are in the cloud space, they don't discover old stuff, right? That brown field, the stuff you already got running in your environment, they just know about the net new stuff, which is fine if you're running only net new things and you've decided, I don't want to combine those worlds. Most people we've talked to, most companies we've talked to, they really want to combine both worlds because they, they're really looking at a cloud management platform. They really want to look at everything holistically. And as soon as you talk about that, then you're in a brownfield. As soon as you're in a brownfield environment, a lot of products really fall short because they don't do that. Uh, because of the history of the product, uh, some very, very strong uh, capabilities in that area because the product wasn't designed to go greenfield. It was designed to really go brownfield first. Uh, and then the abstraction layer for uh, all the different languages that are out there, for the APIs, uh, really gives you a very, very nice abstraction layer, including management into things like Microsoft and PowerShell. And all that comes back into the virtual management database. So all the things that we're talking to in these environments, as we connect to these various compute environments, we're talking not only doing discovery at, at the API level to figure out what's out in, your, in the environment, we're also talking on whatever kind of bus they provide. So if they provide some sort of bus, we're on that bus. That's how we're actually able to intercept when things are happening in that environment. So you decide to move something from point A to point B, and the hypervisor or cloud platform says, now proceeding to move something from point A to point B, we know about it, we know it's on the bus. We can then take a look and see if you're, you're allowed to do that, right? If, if you're doing something that you're not supposed to do, uh, or something you're allowed to do, to, to do that. And we know that because of all this information that we have in the database. So give you a couple examples. Uh, seamless self-service, uh, roles-based delegation uh, for the users, uh, self-service portals. A lot of people are really interested in self-service portals. Uh, service catalog, of course, you expose those to your users. It's great to be able to deploy one thing. It's even better to be able to deploy an entire environment. Maybe you've got a multi-tier application. You want to be able to deploy all of that. Maybe you want to be able to sequence what that looks like. Maybe the database server's got to be up, we ask data in it before you start loading your mid-tier servers. Maybe they need to be up, we ask before you start putting load balancers out in front of it. Maybe they actually need to be answering and doing what they're supposed to before you start delivering traffic to it. Uh, automated provisioning, quotas, and chargeback. Uh, as an IT organization, you may want to say, it's really nice if you can push buttons and get a lot of resources really, really fast. Maybe you don't want them to all hit the button at the same time and everybody uses all the same resources. So maybe you want to be able to enforce things like quota and maybe you want to actually do charge back or show back so that they understand the, the financial implication of what they're doing. And because we can do it across all of these environments, uh, including OpenSec, we can make decisions not only at a technology level, but because we have all this other information in our VMDV, we can also do things like weight, the cost of what these things cost, so that we can determine where you want to deploy and make business decisions about where you want to deploy your workloads, not just technology decisions about where things are going. Give you an example, user self-service automation, right? So the user comes in, does a request, first thing that happens is RBAC. Do they even see the catalog that they want to request out of? Uh, then we go filter through quotas. Are they doing what they're supposed to in their quotas? Are they over quota? Maybe they just get a rejection message that says you need to go ask and, and talk to IT about more quota in your environment. Uh, then maybe you want to go into an approval workflow. 
Uh, maybe your developers are allowed to order three systems and no more. And if it goes over three systems, maybe they have to go to their management or that somebody else that's fiscally responsible for that. So you can have approval workflows. Whatever kind of workflows that you want, whatever you dream of, you can do within this. There. And then intelligent placement based on all of the factors, including who they are, what their quotas are, and all their abilities, including the tagging within the product has the ability to do serious level of tagging. Within that, you can then determine where you want to place your workloads. Um, so, example of that is, where do I have available capacity? Because it's nice that you've requested, but where do I have available capacity? Is there any policies that affect placement? Maybe I want to deploy something, but it's something that uh, might be PCI compliant and, and can only run a PCI compliant container. Well, do I have capacity in the places that I want that to go? And then, which options offer the least cost? Right, so you can make all of those decisions for your users at the highest level and then determine where you're actually going to place that ultimate workload. Executive management. These folks don't log in and look at all the bits and bytes, right? They really want the charts and the graphs and financial management kinds of things, Government, governance and compliance. They want to make sure that what they're running out there is meeting all of their, their responsibilities. They have judiciary responsibilities and regulatory responsibilities. They'd like to have a dashboard be able to look and see what's going on in that environment. Forecasting and planning. Uh, it's great that we've got all of this capacity, but based on current run rates, how much is it going to cost me to run whatever it is that I want to do based on what's going on in the environment? How, if I've got an environment, uh, let's say uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization or VMware in, inside and outside, when am I going to start running out of capacity on some of the projects that maybe are your brownfield projects that you haven't moved someplace else? Maybe you're going to run out of capacity based on the trending much faster than you thought. And you can then take that and look, at, look across environments and determine, hey, I've got this specific workload that's running somewhere. Show me someplace else that I might be able to run this based on its characteristics. How has it been performing over the last 30 days? How much memory does it actually use? How much CPU does it actually use? And then also things like health and availability just give you some good green light, red light, up, down, what's going on in my environment kinds of capabilities. And doing it across all of those environments, not just across one of the environments. Uh, automating IT processes. Maybe you've got a sample rule here. Windows and VM must have Mac be installed. Uh, based on the information that's within the environment, we can determine that using things like smart state uh, technology that's in the product. It's patented technology. allows us to actually read what's on the disk and the underlying, whether it's been powered on, not powered on, whether it's phone home configuration management system or not. We know what's inside that container. We can make, the, make determinations about things that go on. So, you know, only users. Uh, only see the conforming VMs and workloads. Maybe you can see workloads that don't meet that criteria because you put it in the quarantine or something like that. Uh, policy breach notifications automatically. So somebody goes to do something and they break policy and maybe you need to notify the security team, IT management, uh, and the help desk that this is going on, right? The help desk so that they can get a hold of that user quickly, start working with them while the security team finds out that there was some sort of policy breach. So Red Hat. Platforms sits over the top of all these kinds of uh, virtualization and cloud. Uh, Amazon Web Services, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, Red Hat OpenStack, VMware, one that's not on this slide now uh, is Microsoft, and in the next release, even more stuff with Microsoft and Hyper-V. Uh, benefit is you get fastest time to cloud, low acquisition costs, and tool reduction. And Red Hat gives you really this, this, this entire ability to do it on all these, all, all these platforms. You've got it on VMware, Microsoft, uh, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization for your private cloud. Maybe that includes OpenStack. Maybe your hybrid cloud includes stepping out into uh, things like Amazon. And then underpinning all of these projects is, of course, Red Hat Enterprise Linux uh, and OpenStack platform. So you've got uh, all these are on, based on Linux and all these places that we're running things like OpenStack platform. Like I ended up with the duplicate sides here. Right? Oh, just adding the VMware and the Amazon into the same picture here. And then getting started with your private cloud. So private cloud is not just infrastructure as a service, it's not just all of those things. Uh, Red Hat has uh, products in all of these areas. So if you're looking for platforms as a service, you've got OpenShift. Uh, out there, uh, open source product, uh, 
Red Hat Enterprise Linux OpenStack platform, Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure. Red Hat Cloud Infrastructure is uh, a bundle or a, uh, a pricing skew uh, capability to, for doing OpenStack, Red Hat Enterprise Virtualization, some of your uh, Linux licensing. So if you use several of our products together, the licensing is uh, more advantageous as you go up uh, with Red Hat platforms and Enterprise Virtualization. Integrations with a lot of systems that are in the environment. You've probably got some of these in your environment and some of the ones that are TBD. So we're looking at things in the roadmap. Now that the next the announcement on open sourcing has happened, we're expecting those things to start uh, accelerating as these partners really start jumping in and, and look, looking at this. Uh, so did you hear if you weren't paying attention or maybe you were moving? Uh, Red Hat just announced that Cloudforms has been open sourced. So true to Red Hat's name, we took 100, 100 plus million dollar acquisition and we've turned it into open source. Very large leap and jump ahead based on that and it's, and it's a great way to start this uh, environment. Uh, the product originally was Manage IQ. Manage IQ was a company that was acquired. Internally they decided to call ManageIQ.org, the organization that will be the open source organization that uh, will handle that. It's in Red Hat's DNA, we really do believe in open source. We really think it really makes a difference. We do uh, live and breathe this stuff every day and it is really part of the reason why we do what we do. And we really think that all of us working together work better together rather than just one company that working on stuff. Uh, we're the first ones to open source cloud management platform, uh, provides an alternative traditional proprietary management platforms. Of course, as, the, as one of the product managers for platforms, We'd also like for you to buy the Red Hat version of it, the support for that, so that uh, you also get that enterprise support, 24 by 7, 365 support, and all the things that you're used to getting from Red Hat. Uh, so source community is going to have an engineering community that's doing innovation, user community differentiation. There's lots of places for people to plug things in, in the automation space, in, in the control surfaces for monitoring, things like that. Uh, And the advantages, what, what were the things that we're getting out of Manage IQ, small private company, they were resource constrained, Red Hat acquisition, large public company, really putting a lot of innovation into the releases that have come out since it became platforms from Manage IQ. But still resource constrained compared to the entire internet and who really contributed in that environment. And that's really why one of the main pluses that you get out of that uh, announcement is, is that you get a lot of innovation and not all the innovation has to come from within our own core set of and it's one community, you're going to see many projects within it, just like, just like OpenStack has a bunch of different projects within it, we expect a bunch of different projects within the Manage IQ, and that really comes all down and maps into the architecture and taxonomy that uh, will be with this project. Now we'll open it up to Q&A, if you would come to the uh, microphone so that everybody can hear, or I'll try and relay. What license? Uh, what was the license we finally landed on? So, in the community, so if you want to know more about the community, we encourage you to um, actually sign on on managerq.org and we made the announcement today of that community and uh, we're going to release more news in the upcoming weeks in terms of, you know, the entire governance model that provides with the licenses and, uh, and all those kind of things. So stay tuned. But I encourage you, if you want to know more, post future, it's coming, it's going to be announced. I mean, for those of you that may not have been able to hear, ManageIQ.org is going to have all of the licensing and that kind of information and everything that goes on. This is Xavier Lechefond. He's uh, the product manager, um, field product manager for Cloudforms. One of the guys that came over from Manage IQ. Yeah. question was, is, are we really seeing customers that really need to have places, so many clouds, so many different places that they're really managing, and what kind of trends are we seeing there? 
uh, our customers do in the real world, they've got a lot of brownfield, they've got a lot of current environments that they need to be able to add all these capabilities to. Uh, and uh, while a lot of them are looking at OpenStack and looking at things that have, very large corporations have a lot of different pockets and a lot of different silos, and they're all doing different things. And this really allows them to have one place to really start corralling all of that and really have a view of their entire infrastructure. Uh, otherwise, you've got all these little divisions and pockets and everything else. And when they really see this at a high level, they really start becoming excited because they can then say, hey, we can actually roll this up at a real high level and really report back and say, who's doing what and what environments? It really allows them to, to do that roll up, and it makes a big difference to them. Uh, so, and because of it, actually makes them less, less scared about doing more things in more environments because, all right, let's go do a couple open stacks because I can manage and watch all of it from one place. Maybe they're not even managing. Maybe they're just looking at it, just doing the insight of whatever's going on in the environment. Use as much as you want, whenever you want. And then the other part of it is, that it is in your path to cloud, you may or may not be ready to do open stack because you may or may not have workloads that are there. You may or may not want to do some of these pieces or all these pieces. Maybe you'll never go into the public cloud because of regulatory. Uh, maybe that's the first place you want to go as soon as you put something like this in and you've got some governance around it and you can start actually expanding in a, into those kinds of environments. Back here. Yeah, you. Are you speaking specifically to OpenStack auto scaling, or are you talking about just auto scaling as a? Just, just in general. Okay. Yeah. So. Okay. So the question was, is how can we really work with auto scaling? It's uh, actually one of the use cases a lot of people really love about the automation, uh, and also within uh, OpenStack itself. So. Because of the automation model that's within the product, we can make, make decisions about what's going on in the environment and decide to start auto-scaling environments based on the needs. Maybe, you're, maybe it's high CPU utilization. Maybe it's uh, scaling on business-related knowledge, like looking at a corporate calendar and knowing that you've got a marketing uh, event that's going out and start scaling. And maybe that scaling is internal to some point and then external to another point. Maybe you do some of it in-house, some of it external. Uh, there's a lot of scenarios that customers use for that, but really it gets back to the depth of the information that's within the platform and the automation capabilities within it really allow us to do auto scaling in platforms that never knew they had auto scaling, but we're doing that right because we're, we're looking at it holistically and we're really making, making a composition of all of those clouds and all of those environments and really making it better all the way across. I think we have another question here. So can, can the product discover things like compute network, storage resources? So because it's talking to the API layer to whatever the platform is, hypervisor, uh, cloud, or whatever, whatever depth of information they give us is the depth that we can drill down to. Now, there are some cases where we can actually get more information because we're using APIs that actually work under the cover to really discover other things that maybe the management interface doesn't give you, but some of the back-end things like backup APIs and things like that give you, so we can get some depth of information from those, those sources as well. You have a second question? Yeah, my second question is regarding the hardback. That's not a feature on our slides. Yeah, already integrated with Solometer, so you charge back capability. So within the product, have the ability to do charge back. And you can really do very multi-dimensional charge back, depending on how you tag within the environment. Uh, maybe you have higher or lower cost environments. Maybe you've got tiered storage and you want to charge a different amount for usage in each one of those tiers. Maybe you charge for differences in compute, and maybe on some of the other capabilities within the platform. Maybe certain hosts have things like HADRS. 
and you want to charge even more for those environments. So very, very fine grain. And because we're collecting all this information, we can make do all that charge back. The other thing that's nice about collecting all this information is most of the systems out there have amnesia. They keep 30 to 60 days worth of information, which is great for running their platform, not great for you making business decisions on that kind of information. Clean platforms, you can set whatever your retention period is for that and really do it at a, at a basis. So maybe you want to keep 13 months or maybe you want to keep 26 months so you can do year over year comparisons and start being able to do intelligent business decisions based on what was going on previously, maybe on your marketing calendar or whatever you've got going on. So deep integrations there. Question in the back. So I saw that diagram that you integrated with Nova, but there are many other services So we're talking about orchestration, Okay. So we saw that we were talking to Nova, but how are we integrating with some of the other projects and some of the other APIs that are within the product? So uh, like any other product, we're, we're, we're shooting at a moving target because OpenStack's a moving target as well as they keep adding functionality. So we enhance, and with each one of our releases, we enhance more, so as new projects come online and additional APIs come online, we integrate and do those things to get to a deeper level. Uh, so with any of the platforms that we interact with, we generally start at the insight level, then start adding all these uh, other depths of, of uh, integrations. Uh, the nice thing is through Automate and because of the rest of the model, even if it's something brand new, we have a way to reach out using those APIs to do that very new thing that you just got, but later it becomes productized and we start rolling those kinds of features, especially the kinds of features that more customers would use. We start really looking at those kinds of use cases and, and start adding that into the product uh, so that it becomes a regular part of the product rather than just an automation extension. Question? I don't think you answered the question. How do you guys Uh, our integration with the heat template, so we've got examples through automation integrating with heat to be able to do uh, heat integration currently, next release, even uh, more uh, depth as for our heat integration, uh, being able to use heat as it's, as, as it's natively created, be meant to be consumed. So with, with Cloud Forms, there is two types of integration. There is the out of the box where you start uh, you know, integrating and having this one-to-one -one peer knowledge with the, um, the domain expertise, so let's say the example of heat uh, or you know neutron or whatever. So that you know comes and you know there's a whole set of capabilities associated with that, being able to discover it, being able to, to discover the elements of those environments and so forth. But there's also the ability for the users to be able to expand the reach that outcomes may have with third-party domains, right? So heat is one good example right now where we have generated our essays and our private community right now that is going to expand into the public community once we fully open source in a couple of weeks, um, that will be able to have models on how you start integrating, start dynamically allocating, you know, heat templates and start driving them uh, through the automation platform itself. And then what we do is we take those use cases that our user needs and we bring them back to the cloud platform itself. As a replacement? As, 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 as an extension to make it easier if you want to, to start driving. So if we take the example of heat, the idea would be to that our automation engine that is a you know, part of an engine inside the, uh, the cloud forms um, set of architecture can now start doing a lot of work and start discovering those heat templates. It can start allocating them, deploying them, ensuring that there's a loop back within the automation that you can drive it you know, to its automation engine. Um, so, forgive me if I, if I don't follow. Walking through the problems, I brought a heat template. Yeah. I, I send that to So Cloud Forms then registers, let's say, to capture events, right, that may be needed by the application itself, either in QPIN or RabbitMQ, and start being able to understand that there's a flex that is required for these, you know, application itself. And it starts monitoring and making the association between the workload, the instance that is running, and the visibility that it has directly into Cloud Forms. So we can walk through that in-depth model if you want, in terms of, I mean, I don't know that everybody's interested in that, but I can walk you through. I need to change my open stack. Well, you might and you might not. I mean, it depends. I mean, everything is, you know, some of them are registering directly to the event bus, right, to be able to capture that information and get it back into the loop. So, um, you know, as the platform evolves, I mean, 
expecting that you know there's going to be more and more normalization, you know, where we'll be able to you know automatically you know associate those events and start you know understanding capacity utilization of that particular service and then automatically flex it because an event was needed because we get over a threshold or these kind of things and then in the return start invoking heat and be able to say hey go ahead and implement this extension right and start scaling it up. So we can I, I mean I'm happy to work with you through those scenarios. Yeah, please. We're gonna, we've got booth down there. Please yeah, come that's by. That's why the yeah. community is going to be about. I think yeah. this is a very, very good discussion. So we want the linkage between you know the OpenStack community, the domain, and manager to you know be more you know closely linked together. So I think this is absolutely why we are here and why we are doing this. Question in the back. Yeah. So if I understand correctly, you are including some kind of business modeling, business process modeling engine within the within the product itself, or or you're architecturally able to integrate with one. <coughs> That's, I think, where I'm a little bit confused. Are you saying that, okay, we have all this data and we can allow users to define decisions that maybe trigger triggers a heat template, maybe it does something that's accessible with an API? Or are you saying, if I have one, an engine like that, I can integrate with it? So or maybe, or maybe it's both. You've, you've got, got both. So, so there's capabilities within the product itself uh, to be able to hand, handle events, conditions, and actions based on those, and really make, model those kinds of things and be able to do those kinds of things. Are predefined or are they definable? No, no totally definable by you. You can determine to create whatever you want. You can create your own synthetic events, based on a combination of events to then trigger and do things that you want to do. And you also have the ability to do, to call out to other systems like the RMS systems okay. to be able to integrate. A lot of work that is going on right now as part of you know, the open sourcing effort is to make it more definable actually so that you can start extending it very easily, reaching out to other systems. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions in the house? Yep. Yes, sir. Uh, say something more about the microscope integration. Specifically, are you talking about the viewer, hyper-V, the event? So, so uh, currently we've got uh, in uh, technology preview for those customers who are doing it, the ability to talk to Microsoft uh, uh, virtualization. And system center VMM. System center VMM and enhanced capabilities in next release, uh, talking through system center VMM uh, for more additional capabilities. And then roadmap items are definitely tighter, tighter and deeper integration. So like, like we do with any platform that we first connect to, we, we start at the, at the insight and then start adding the additional capabilities. So, 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 so one thing I mean, that you can see is that there's a lot of providers out there, right? I mean, I mean, you need a lot of hands to be able to advance those capabilities, right? So what we think is that what Red Hat truly believes is that the, the power of the open source community in those cases where, you know, by open sourcing this, we hope that, uh, and we we the cross community so that we can extend it much faster, you know, reaching out to those providers. So I mean, just, you know, I know that we, we had Microsoft Direct Hyper-V support for while extending to a CPMM, in, you know, right now it's in the time we've done the, the, the preview. Um, and then the next step is Azure, obviously. Um, but you know, it's, it's coming. And if we're not limiting it. I mean, absolutely not to one provider. Uh, it, the goal is to truly open hybrid in the town, right? Another question here? So, uh, when you bring platforms into an existing brownfield environment, can you quantify how much customization and the development work needs to be done to get work in it? So definitely go in a brownfield environment. It discovers by talking to the hyper, hypervisor or cloud platform, and really gathers all the data about what's going on. Whatever its retention period is, it's got 30 days worth of statistics or whatever. Gathers all that kind of data, uh, and depending on what you want to do in the environment, really determines what what you do. Generally, those that would be uh, either your own internal developers or professional services helping you in doing some of the automation. Uh, use cases. Usually uh, people have manual processes that they don't want to automate uh, or there's some information about their environment that just needs to be understood from a dom domain modeling standpoint to know how to how to carve things make things up, how to tag it, how to show what are, you know, wh who are the tenants and how that's set up. Uh, that's all base capability of the product. Uh, people get, get a lot of bang out for their buck right out of the gate uh, and are able to do s simple uh, provisioning use cases and things like that. Almost, I mean, when we do go into POC environments, we'll connect to it, and usually by lunchtime, we're doing the first of the easy, easy scenarios of doing self service automation uh, in those environments. All right, any other questions?
questions. I think we're about, about to bump into the next session. Thank you, everybody. Uh, please visit us at our booth. We've got a booth uh, down uh, on the floor. And uh, come by here if you want to talk. I'll be here afterwards. Uh, thanks very much.